Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast, episode number four. This is Jim Kruger from antleritis.com, and you're listening to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, and we have a fantastic show for you today. Um, First, I'd like to say thank you for listening to the show. We could not be here without you. And here's our show lineup for today. So uh, we have Joe Cervello from New York Antler Outdoors. Uh, which will give us some great insights into actually deer hunting itself. Joe is a an accomplished hunter and has basically done uh, something that someday we all hope to do, and that is to take the skill level to a point where all you do is hunt with the most primitive weapons uh, that is available to us. Uh, Joe has done that, and we get to learn all his tips and tricks, and he shares all of that with us here today on the Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast. Um, Larry Tatum phones in a deer registration with the Big Buck Registry, and uh, we'd like to cover some things on the Facebook page, Twitter, and what exactly is a podcast. And we're also going to check in on the contest to see who's winning and who's not. So let's uh, let's go right over to the Facebook page. All right. So if you wanted to follow us on Facebook, all you have to do go, is to go to facebook.com forward slash big buck registry. That is our Facebook handle. And that's one place where you can follow us. Another place is the is Twitter. And that is twitter.com forward slash big buck registry. There's another place where you can find us. And one of the things, and uh, we're doing a podcast here today, but I wanted to kind of explain what a podcast is. A podcast is basically a audio show. Um, it can be a video, but we're doing an audio cast, and it is a downloadable type of audio show, and it is available through a few different directories. The major one is Apple's iTunes, and that is where you can find us um, most frequently, you can also find us on Zoom Xbox. So the Microsoft Zoom Xbox system actually has a directory for podcasts. And, well, we are broadcasting on both. Um, so that's one place where you can find us. So if, uh, if you want to check us out, you can do so there. Now, on the contest, uh, it looks like things are kind of heating up here. Um, of course, the last day to submit a buck was on January 31st, and that was for the submission. Now we're into the voting stage, and the voting stage is going to go through February 28th, and we'll announce the winner on, let's see, February, no, uh, March 1st is when we're going to announce the winner of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Contest. So if you would still like to submit a deer, not for the contest, but just to submit it in general, uh, you can go and post directly on Facebook by simply going to share your photo under the post section. Uh, You can also go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash submit and attach your story and or or video there or photo. Um, And you can also send in a Facebook mail. That's one way to do it. Or email. And email is photos at bigbuckregistry.com. But let's just kind of cruise through the contest and see who's winning the contest at the moment um by the looks of it 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 appears that i think jamie boyd has jumped up a lot uh zach mckenzie had pulled ahead last week with 416 votes and now jamie is back in the lead uh it appears that he has eight eight hundred and sixteen likes so far so at the moment jamie has jumped up significantly i don't know how he did it but um, certainly people are liking his, uh, we've also got, uh, Zach at 486. Uh, we've got Lucas Brown with 202. So he's doing pretty well. Um, Chelsea Hall, who we spoke to in a previous episode is at, uh, 236. So she's doing fairly well. 
um, and Dalton Campbell, who we spoke with. And Dalton is at uh, 321, so he's doing very well. Uh, A couple other notables. One is the Corwin Ridgeway Buck. He's at 193 votes. And Greg Ridgeway, who we hope to talk to soon, is at 143. Um, just running down Cameron Criddle. That's the young man with the, uh, the the really nice picture of a big buck. He's at 122. And Mac, Mac, Matt McKenzie's at 113. Um, let's see. Lionel McGraw is at one, uh, 103 with his uh jumper buck so he's uh he's holding out and there are a few others that are at 90 67 and 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 so forth so check out our page again the registry uh, the big buck registry contest is on on facebook it's under the deer of the year nominee album so just go to our photos click on photos and then that'll bring you to all of our albums and in that that directory you'll find the deer of the year pictures um or the album to look at the contest okay so that's a wrap-up of the contest at the moment uh good luck to everybody good luck to the underdogs uh jamie boyd has a significant lead but uh we would certainly like to see some other votes from other contestants to make this thing very interesting so good luck to everybody and uh we'll we'll announce the winner again on march 1st uh next up let's listen to larry tatum phone in a deer registration with a big buck registry and you can do this as well by calling 724-613-2825 again that's 724-613-2825 you have three minutes to tell us your name the county and state in which the deer was harvested a story behind the deer uh, the number of points and the pounds uh, of the deer, if you have it, um, and we love it. We love the phone registration. Uh, it makes it interesting. We can post it on the podcast, and uh, it's kind of cool. So you can do that by again seven two four six one three two eight two five. Another way that you can do it actually is a brand new setup. You can go right through our website, and at the top uh, top left of our website, you'll see a tab called Speak Up. And all you have to do is click on the tab, and if you have a microphone attached to your computer, you can voice in a comment, a question, or a deer registration right there. Again, bigbuckregistry.com, and you'll see the tab there that says Speak Up. So that's another way to, to voice in a call. So let's uh, let's listen to Larry's registration. Hey, Jay, this is Larry Tatum. I just sent you some pictures of a buck I just shot, uh, probably uh, two and a half, three, middle of November, down here in South Florida. Um, the buck was a 12-point, typical, and uh, right at 190 pounds of weight. It's probably going to be the top 10 biggest typical bucks ever killed in Florida. I'm waiting for it to come back from the taxidermist so I can get a, a neck score. It was still uh, under 60 days. They wouldn't give me a scoring on it. So I'm just waiting for it to come back. Hope all goes well. All right, that was Larry Tatum. Thanks, Larry, for registering your deer with the Big Buck Registry through The Voice. We've posted some pictures as well on the Facebook page and on our main page at bigbuckregistry.com. Uh, next up is Joe Cervello, and Joe is a very experienced hunter, and we learned a lot from Joe. Uh, Joe uh, spends a, quite a bit of time with us in detail and gives us all his tips and tricks um, that has brought him from the gun hunter down to the primitive weapon hunter to the point where he's not using a compound bow. Uh, he's just using a, a basic bow these days. So um, if you really want to learn something about deer hunting, listen to the Joe Cervello interview from New York Antler Outdoors. And that's coming up next. Stay tuned. We are the nation's deer pool registry organization dedicated to protecting and preserving the story, sport, and spirit of big buck hunting and helping you take your hunt to the next level. Welcome back, everybody. This is Jay Scott, and I am here with Joe Cervello from the New York Antler Outdoors, and he is our special guest today, and we are very excited to have him because he knows a lot about deer hunting and white-tailed deers in New York. So, Joe, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I don't know about knowing, being being the uh, guru, so to speak, but I'm sure I can answer some questions. <laughs> well, that's cool. I, I have a feeling you know more than a lot of people, so um, by default, you are an expert. Well, thank you for that. Cool. So tell us uh, about where you're at and, and kind of what you're doing. 
Well, actually, um, it all started a while back. I uh, I used to have a magazine called Antler Magazine that I published here in New York State. Actually, I sold it all across the country, and um, it was pretty popular here in New York. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very lucrative venture. I did it for five years. The magazine was quite popular here in New York. Matter of fact, it was probably one of the top selling uh, deer hunting magazines in New York at the time, back in the mid mid to late nineties. And then I did a little offshoot television one-time only program about New York state hunting. And uh, this is just an offshoot of that that I did a few years later. I started it about three years ago. And basically what I did was I wanted to, uh, I wanted to have something different than anything else that was out there. Yep. M- make it more of an entertainment type of a thing. And so I produced the, this. To, it was easier for me to do. I could do it um, in my spare time. I have it. I'm a measurer for the New York State Big Buck Club. I'm pretty active in a bunch of you know different whitetail deer organizations. So I have an in uh, to some of the bigger bucks in the state. So I thought I'd make a website where guys can come and see what's being taken across the state and kind of enjoy the thing just for its entertainment purposes. That's cool. I, I like what you're doing. I, I like that you've uh, picked the state that you live in and, and you're trying to. Um, promote the state for its deer hunting and it's something you know well so you're, you're you're making a go of it of something you have a good knowledge of i think that's very cool yeah exactly that's that's kind of why it all came about just uh new york's always been kind of um behind the eight ball as far as the rest of the states in the country as far as having some place where guys can go to see you know the type of really exceptional bucks that are being taken around the state as well as you know, we do stories about anybody's buck. If they want to send us a story, we put that up. We put their picture up. We allow them to upload their own photos and tell a little bit about things. Um, there's some information pages on the page as well. Yeah. You know, things from my experiences, some of the knowledge that I have that just gathered over the years. Gotcha. I'm 53 years old, so I've been hunting for quite some time. And um, and I hunt here in New York primarily. Right. I don't go too much outside the state. We've always heard good things about New York State, even even when I was uh, I'm 41. So I, I I've heard a lot of good things going back even to my youth, and it seemed like all the guys I grew up who hunted, uh, you know, they they do a trip out to New York now and then, and they come home with a lot of deer, but they'd have a lot more stories to tell than what we would have uh, up here in New Hampshire. So it was it was kind of interesting, and it was always one of those hunts you wanted to kind of get on when the guys went. Yeah, uh, New York is it's it's kind of a funny state to hunt in because it's um there's a lot of different kinds of hunting depending on where you live in the state or or where you travel to do your hunting. Uh the western part of the state, uh you know, the hunting's a little different there than it would be in the Adirondack Mountains and a little different there than it would be let's say down in Westchester County closer to to you know Long Island and New York City area or the suburbs I should say in New York City where they do a lot more bow hunting. The bucks are quite large up there because they don't have the gun hunting to uh put the same kind of pressure we put here. Uh, the Adirondacks, obviously, is an adventure in itself. Um, the deer are few and far between. The density is, you know, not so good, but there's a lot of whitetails up there, and there's a lot of big whitetails. And then in western New York, you're looking at a high agricultural area. Same thing with, with central New York, very high agricultural area. Um, so you have fine farmland, and the hunting's a little different. You know, a lot more tree stand hunting in those areas. Adirondacks, at least the guys that I know and the way that I hunt in the Adirondacks, is primarily tracking, stalking type of, of hunting for just bigger bucks alone. Right. And then, uh, although I haven't had the pleasure of doing any bow hunting down in the Westchester, Suffolk County, you know, that Long Island kind of uh, areas down that way, um, the guys who hunt there, I mean, it's a different style of hunting than it is here. But it's, you know, if you put it all together, right, New York's actually a pretty good place to hunt. It seems that way. I'm glad you said that because you know New York is a fairly big state, and it seems like you have a lot of different aspects of how to go about it. You, you get down around New York City, um, you're going to be talking bow hunting, and then you you've got the mountains, and you've got I don't know what's out west that have never really been out there other than to to visit. Yeah, Western New York is is different because it's very agricultural. I mean, you know, they have the Allegheny State Park there, which is um, you know, a pretty big state forest, which is a great area to, to hunt. <clears throat> but it's it's different than the Adirondack Mountains, which is very vast. Um, it's just a, a much tougher place to hunt. Uh, a lot of guys are very intimidated by it. um, its vastness. I are worried about getting lost up there. Um, parts of western New York, especially like Erie County, 
um, in New York and some of the counties out that way. Um, they're actually residential areas um, with, you know, little farm communities, agricultural areas that kind of surround that. And, you know, guys have smaller bits of land. Uh, they hunt primarily from tree stands. A lot of guys do. Yeah. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a lot. There, there are so many different ways to hunt throughout New York. Um, I guess it just depends on, uh, you know, what you've been exposed to over the years and that kind of thing that makes it interesting in those parts. I hunt way, a lot differently than most guys in the state do. Um, our state seems to be, when you talk to most deer hunters, which I get a chance to talk to a lot of them, I, I am the MC for the New York State Big Buck Club banquet every year. So I get to hand out all the um, certificates and, you know, shake hands with the guys and kind of talk amongst the guys every year. And I've been doing it for about 12 or 13 years now. So I talk to all different types of hunters. And it, it's, the stories are so different depending on what areas they hunt in. And western New York is just one of those places where, you know, it's primarily tree stand hunting and that type of thing. So gotcha. it's just a little bit different. Gotcha. Now, have you ever hunted down around the, the New York City area? No, I haven't. I, years ago, I had an opportunity to go down there. They do a late, well, back then they did. I don't know about now, but back then they did a late shotgun hunt in January. And I thought about going down there for a late shotgun hunt just simply because, you know, I like to get as much time in as I, as I can hunting. So I said, ah, oh, geez, you know, our season ends in early December here in central New York and, you know, most of, the, of uh, New York State. But down there they had, now you get in another couple of weeks later on in January. But it never came to fruition, so, you know, it's one of those things I never got right. to do, but I wish I had. I would like to do some bow hunting down there. But, it, you know, it's one of those pla- places where if you don't have an in, it's really tough to get an in because there's, it's just so restricted as far as the amount of hunting area that there is. And then the guys are, you know, they're pretty um, adamant about kind of keeping <laughs> it to themselves, which I don't blame them. Right. Oh, uh, so you think that's... come out of there are just uh, terrific. As a matter of fact, in the last few years, last year we had the biggest buck, a non-typical um, with archery taken all time in New York State. Broke the record that was held uh, since 1996. Is that right? Oh, no kidding. Yeah. It seems like there are a lot of uh, records that have been broken this past year. Uh, I don't know if it's because of a mild winter or, or what the situation was, but it seems like a lot of records fell in different states this year for different categories. I think a lot of that, it probably did have to do with the weather last year because it was so mild. Right. But I think, too, I think you're going to see that there's going to be a change in the quality of, or the size of the bucks, I should say. I mean, quality is, I guess, is a subjective term. But um, in the size of the bucks, uh, you're going to see a change because a lot more guys are getting into the whole concept of, you know, protecting younger deer and, you know, working towards bigger age class of deer being in the population so that, uh, you know, that there's a lot more bucks of different sizes that are out there. New York's well known for, um, at least in the past years, for being a high young buck, age, which means, you know, you're not leaving the opportunity for a lot of deer to get older as they, and get to the higher age classes. So um, you, you, back in the 70s and 80s, you didn't see as many of the bigger bucks being taken as you do today. Right. And it's more of a mindset, I think, really, than it than it's anything biological so much right now. I think the guys are just passing on smaller deer, which allows them some time to maybe be able to encounter something that's a little bit bigger. Right. It, it seems like it's hard to sometimes get everybody on board with that concept, but I think there's more and more people thinking about that kind of thing. I, I think you're right. I think that's why we're starting to see some bigger deer, because... Um, it's always in the back of somebody's mind. But I, I think in order to make that work, you have to have one person kind of set the stage and then trust that the other guy is not going to pull the trigger, too. Right, which is which is a tough thing, especially here in New York State. Um, just the way that the, the deer population has been managed over the years, um, it's just a little different of the mindset that most of the hunters have. And I, I suppose it's, it's all about what your hunting experience is. Like for me, personally, um, I, don't, I have an opinion about the things that have to do with, uh, you know, protecting yearling, yearling bucks and uh, the whole QDM thing that's out there now. I spoke on that 20 years ago before anybody in New York State ever even knew what the program was about. And I was a, a big fan of it back then um, simply because, I suppose it was it was new. It was different. I've, I've gotten to be less of a fan of the actual 
modern day program. And I mean, I, I believe in the concept of it all. I just think it's transitioned into something that never was meant to be. But the whole thing in New York, guys passing the yearling bucks and uh, shooting, you know, looking for, for bigger deer, that's a hard one, I think, for a lot of the guys to swallow. And I think with education, and once guys realize, you know, the benefits of some of that, it's going to turn out better. Me personally, I, the way I hunt, I'm, I'm strictly a big buck hunter. So a change in the law or not a change in the law, mandate, no mandate, isn't, doesn't really affect my experience hunting. Um, I just... I do have an opinion on it, but I, um, as far as I'm concerned, either way it wouldn't matter to me. I just think it's a good idea to pass in the yearling bucks, allow some guys opportunity maybe to kill more mature deer later down mm-hmm. the road. And I, and I personally know from my research and everything and the history of me speaking on it that it's uh, it definitely benefits the herd in some way to have a better age class of bucks, a structure that's a little bit more stretched out than just yearling bucks and a spattering of mature deer. Right. What's your... Yeah, uh, it changed, though. It's changing in New York State. I can see that already. Yeah, I, I think it's changing in a lot of places. Um, what, what's your take on meat hunting? Uh, would you take a doe? Oh, absolutely. I uh, Normally, for me, I um, because I hunt bigger bucks, I, you know, I take a bigger buck about every other year. Maybe I might be two years in between. Um, so... For me, you know, if I want venison, I usually fill my doe tags. I usually wait though till the end of the season. I, I am, I'm like an anomaly when it comes to hunters because I have gone from um, just being the everyday hunter that most people think about to being the kind of guy that is very traditional now. I stepped away from um, compound bow hunting. I don't own a compound bow anymore. I, I hunt strictly with the recurve wooden arrows. I, um, I hunt with a, an old side hammer, hawk and muzzleloader round ball and patch. Um, I, sh- I, I shoot a single shot rifle when I hunt in the Adirondacks. Um, it's an odd six, but it's, <laughs> excuse me, it's a single shot. And you know, it, For me, it's more about the challenge. If I never kill a buck again in my life, I, it, it, it won't disappoint me. Right. It, it's more about the experience for me and a story to tell, and that's what it is about me. So I'm a little different than the average hunter as far as that goes. But as far as meat hunting goes, it depends on how you use the term meat hunting. Yeah. Like, I, I kind of have a problem when guys use the term meat hunting as their defense against um, passing on yearling bucks, you know, that whole program. Right. I, I feel that for most people, there's probably a small percentage of people that, you know, are a little bit hard on, on their luck, and, you know, they the venison might be really important for them to feed their family. But for most of us, we all know that, you know, I don't think we're going to starve to death if we don't take a white-tailed deer. Um, you know, for what it costs to to buy your license and do all the other things, to buy the ammunition and keep up your gun and have the clothing and all the other things it takes to deer hunt. If you think of it, you know, price per pound of meat, you get a better deal at the grocery store. So, I mean, some guys use the term a little too loosely as a defense for why they don't seem to like maybe an antler restriction in their area. Um, rather than look at what the actual science about it is, how it benefits or doesn't benefit, and and use that as your criteria to, for whether or not you're into that kind of thing or not into that kind of thing. Right. That's just, that's my my opinion about it. So as far as I, I mean, I'm a meat hunter, I guess, like everybody else, because I love venison, but I don't use that term um, as a defense for my hunting. It's just part of what I like to do. Usually, what I do once I've gotten a deer. Uh, which is a venison for my household, I normally donate any other um, deer that I get after that right. to a venison drive. That's just my, my thing. Yeah. So meat hunting, yeah, I mean, I guess the term, depending on how you use it, I think we're all meat hunters as long as you like venison. I think that's what we're all out there doing is trying to get a little venison in the freezer as well as some maybe some antlers. Right, yeah, there's always that adage, you can't eat the horns. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's overused. It's it's almost a defense mechanism for it for shooting something that you know could have been a little more managed. And um, it seems like I I like to take a doe when I have the opportunity. Um, and I'm not always hunting the antlers. That's, that's no question about it. Mm-hmm. But, but I I will pass on a smaller deer, especially a smaller buck, for one that is bigger. But the problem is in in, in our area. You don't have a ton of guys that are really um, 
subscribing to that philosophy. So you may, right. not, you may not actually have an opportunity. But it's nice when you get in an area where that's actually happening. Right. Now, see, in, in, the way I look at it is, um, and I started uh, the big buck hunting only uh, 15, 20 years ago. I mean, I was doing it early on. It, it just because, you know, not that deer hunting got to be easy for me, or I should say buck hunting got to be easy, but it, it was getting to be less of a challenge to just kill it, any buck for me. Yep. So uh, for me, like I said, it's more about the experience and the story. I started getting heavily into tracking whitetails and, you know, tr- looking for bigger bucks. And so it, it changed my whole thought process. It just, just made it that much more fun to me. But, you know, one of the arguments, I guess, that a lot of guys have for passing on younger deer is that they're afraid that if they pass on it, it's only going to get shot by their neighbor who, you know, hunts in the next lot over and, and you know, they aren't going to pass on it. And, I, you know, I, there's, there's a lot to that. That's probably why, you know, a lot of the um, voluntary passing on yearlings is tough because, you know, you're not going to have a, a foolproof program as if you mandated, you know, something like that where everybody had to do the same thing. But, I mean, then there's issues on both sides of that. Right. But I think that my, my thought has always been that I know for sure that if I don't shoot that buck, it has a chance of living. I also know that if I do shoot that small buck, it has zero percent percent chance of becoming a mature buck. Right. So I I think that by me passing out, I know I've given that thing at least another chance and increased its odds of becoming a mature buck. Um, hoping that he doesn't walk in front of somebody who you know doesn't have the restraint that I have. Right. Um, th- that's my mindset on the thing. What do you think we could do as a uh, a group or even in, maybe on the state level to pass that message along maybe not adopt a, a mandatory thing but more of a just a philosophy how do you think we could go about doing that well I, uh, honestly i think it's already kind of started i if you look at some of the things that are put up by the dc if you go on their website and kind of get into the whole yearling buck protection and some of the um the antler restriction programs they have in some of the different wmus on uh in the eastern part, well, southeastern part of the state, um, you'll see that although they don't really um, say, they won't come out and say that there's any imminent biological need for it in New York, which I agree with. I, I mean, there, there's no danger to our whitetail population at this point where um, our herd is so unhealthy that, that, you know, stretching out the age structure in the bucks is going to make a lot of difference biologically and health-wise. Um, although I don't think that the the population is at, a, at its optimum health, what it could be, what it you know, if you went for the highest standard, we we don't reach it. Um, we're basically shoot for the minimal standard, which so the deer can get through, and we have a population of whitetails that the guys can hunt without being overpopulated. But you know, having said that, I I think the DEC is kind of seeing that this is something that guys are interested in, and that you know, they're willing to at least learn about. And I think in the in the long run, I'm going to think, I think you're going to see a lot more promotion, um, or at least a lot more positive thoughts by the DEC and, you know, New York State Conservation um, as far as, you know, the, the whole yearling buck protection and how it, you know, it could be a good thing for New York State. Right. But they won't come right out now and say that there's any biological need for it. And I agree that there's not. It just, we're not in any imminent danger of losing our buck population or, you know, having a lot of sick deer running around. Right. <laughs> They've been surviving for a lot longer than we've been hunting them. <laughs> right. Uh, it, so. That reminds me of something we had. It was uh, what I would deem an anti-hunter on the Big Buck Registry Facebook page the other day posted something about, oh, you get all you guys out there with guns, you, you're not as brave as you think uh, for, for shooting a harmless, defenseless animal. And... My response to that was, um, I don't know why you're using the word brave, because last I checked, deer hunting is not a threat to our national security. Um, it's not; you shouldn't even be using it in the same breath. You know, this is a this is a recreation. This isn't. There's not. I don't know if there's anything brave about deer hunting. Um, yeah, it's not. It's not us against the deer. It never. No, has that. no, we're not trying Especially to. Especially looking at it from a conservation point of view. Yeah. It's it's probably it. Well, it's not probably. It's a, it's a known fact that it's the greatest. Uh, population control and management uh, tool 
for you know keeping populations in check, not just from, for the white tail, but right. for other animals too. Yeah, they're they're not trying to eliminate us. We're not trying to eliminate them. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Exactly. We're trying to have an, an extreme balance of between us and them, um, and making sure that they're, they're thriving. In fact, uh, it, I mean, we could uh, we support the conservation efforts, not the other way around. And we probably support it um, as well as anybody supports it. I mean, you know, our thought process isn't necessarily just kill, kill, kill for most hunters. I mean, right. they understand the concept that. You know, this is a conservation effort, and and, it, and that if guys don't understand that, then you know, then that would be a problem. And then you know, we all know that there are hunters out there that, you know, it's it's merely a selfish thing, and that's that's one of the things I guess that uh, kind of bothers me a little bit about some of the New York State hunters that I've met is that most of the things, you know, whenever they see a new law that's coming in effect, or you know, something else DC decides to do which they think is good for conservation. Most guys are more concerned about how is it going to affect, you know, my ability to put a deer in the freezer or hang a deer, a buck on the wall, um, rather than say, you know, look at the conservation point of it and tell themselves, all right, is this a good idea or a bad idea? And use that, again, as a criteria for whether or not you're for or against something. It's very easy to say, you know, well, you know, I just want to get a buck every year. I really don't care. I just, uh, you know how it benefits the herd or doesn't benefit the herd. I just want to take my deer. I spend a lot of money for my license, and that's all I care about. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think that mentality is something that I know it's out there, but I just don't think it's a good thing. I don't think it's really the way that, that hunters should be thinking if they want to keep their right to be able to hunt in New York State anyway. Right. I agree with you. Absolutely. Um, so I want to switch gears here just a little bit and you had uh, you described the types of um, weapons that you're using to hunt these days, and it sounds like you've become essentially the master of your craft. What I'd like to hear a little bit is um, what techniques do you use to become a successful hunter um, that could be passed along to all of our listeners? The first thing I tell people is don't take it so seriously. It needs to be enjoyable because that keeps you in the woods that you don't put pressure on yourself. It allows you to kind of open up to new ideas to be able to try different things that, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the how-to type of magazines, the how-to type of TV shows, uh, although that stuff can be good for newbies, for, you know, the guys who are just beginning and they're kind of trying to find their way and get an idea for what guys do to put themselves, you know, where there's deer. I, I kind of evolved a little bit beyond that i mean obviously that's where we all start and we learn from our fathers or our uncles or whoever it is that kind of takes us in the woods the first time out but for me it's it's a lot different and i find that i have i've had a lot of success once i started not putting so much pressure on myself to to have to take a deer it's not a competition it's not you know it's not to see who can stack the most antlers in their garage in their basement or on their wall and i take it now is more of a kind of a learning experience without getting too deep. I mean, I don't mean to get that deep into it. It's actually right. much more simple than that for me. But I found that when I changed my attitude towards hunting and how I'm going to hunt and what type of deer I'm going to hunt, I put myself in places that allowed me to be a lot more successful. Now, I spent the first nine years of, of hunting when I was a young man never having taken a deer, right. any type of deer. And there were, there were years that I went where I never even saw a deer in those nine years. Right. And basically what, how that transpired was when I had started hunting with my father, it was always, this is the way we hunt. And so I was hunting the way he liked to hunt. And it was always sitting back in, in the 70s, early 70s. We didn't have the clothing we have now or the boots or even the weaponry that we have now. Nor do we know as much biologically about whitetails as we do. So my father's concept was let's sit for as long as we can until we start to freeze to death. Then we'll go have some lunch. We'll come back, and later on in the afternoon, maybe we'll you know, make a small push here, or we'll go sit again someplace else. And that wasn't productive for me. Right. So as I got older and started to hunt by myself, I said, I like to be mobile. I personally do not like the idea of waiting around for whitetails to show up and sit in a tree stand all day and wait. For some guys, they love it. And that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that way of hunting. A lot of guys are very successful that way. Um, me, I'm a little bit more antsy than that. <laughs> so 
So for me, I have to go to the whitetail. And once I realized that I didn't want to hunt smaller bucks anymore, I was going after the bigger bucks, I, I asked myself, you know, what do I need to do to put myself in the place of bigger deer? And the simple answer to the question is, you, you go to the places where you know that big bucks hang out the denser areas, the, you know, the swamp lands, the heavier, brushy areas, and you just pussy foot on through and, and until you encounter one. And the, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, you know, tracking whitetails, I usually get on a decent buck every time I, I hit the woods, especially if I'm in the snow. And I know pretty much before I catch up to a deer whether or not I'm going to shoot him or not. Now, whether I catch up to him or not is, you know, one of the things that – doesn't happen all the time. I mean, that's the part that makes it difficult is actually catching up to the deer and seeing him before he sees you. Right. But but doing that and passing on the younger bucks, I actually started putting myself in a place where there was all kinds of deer. And, I mean, I went from not seeing deer to passing on, you know, 10, 15, 20 deer a year. And, and the whole, just what I learned from not pulling the trigger on every deer, the first deer that I saw, gave me an opportunity to kind of learn a little bit more, spend more time in the woods, see deer in their element doing what they do when they don't know you're there and you're not going to shoot them. Right. So you learn things about the animals, and that brings you closer and closer to um, being a lot more successful. And that's what's been successful for me. Going to the traditional stuff was more about me... um, you know, I got to be where I didn't have any problem taking a buck every year. Or if, if there was two deer to be taken, I could take two deer. And it wasn't as much of a challenge for me, just simply because how I was hunting was putting me in front of a lot more deer than I had in the past. So I started putting little restrictions on myself, and it started slowly. You know, I, I didn't start out just, let me say, I'm going to throw my compounds away. I, I bought a recurve. I started using that occasionally. And then I slowly weaned myself off the compound bow, and and I still hunted in the tree stand at that time during bow season. Now I've kind of put the ultimate restriction where I want to kill a buck with my recurve on the ground, and I want it to be a buck that makes the record book in New York State, wow. twenty yards and in. Wow! So, I mean, I haven't <clears throat> killed I haven't killed a buck with my bow in the last twelve years. I've passed on over a hundred bucks. I've had an opportunity at only two deer that met my criteria. I mean, opportunity meaning they were within range, I was on the ground, they were, you know, the standard of a buck that I was looking for. I just didn't get that shot opportunity. You know, the actual shot opportunity. It just didn't meet itself. There was too much right. rushing away. Right. And, you know, I, and it's not frustrating to me anymore because I have to do it a certain way, so for me it's it's a, you know I, that one didn't work out with this next year or next week or tomorrow and i don't put the pressure on myself to say i have to do this or else you know i'm some kind of, i'm not some kind of a hunter uh, so i changed my mindset changed the way i do things it's a lot more fun for me um i don't stress out about not taking a deer um those things that, so it's made it better and i think it makes me a more successful hunter that way because i don't put the pressure like that on myself right so it sounds like you've gone, you went from basically being a stand hunter to getting on the ground, moving, exploring, learning the habitat where the deer are hanging out and just adopting that into your, your hunting profile. Um, it sounds like you've even gone to a tracking type style. Tell us. Uh, well, I've, I've always, I've, I've done that for a long time. You're right. It, I have, I have kind of transitioned to that uh, from tree stand sitting every once in a while. You know, I'll climb up in a tree stand just to kind of relax and enjoy the scenery and, you know, just kind of get my breath back. And, and it, when you know, it's a slow day for whatever reason. Maybe the weather's not cooperating. Um, so it's not that I don't ever get up in a stand anymore, but I don't spend much more time than a half hour, 45 minutes there. I, uh, I, I do like the idea of, of tracking because, like I said, I, I, I usually can put myself on something that I know I'm going to shoot um, immediately, which means that, while I'm on that track during the course of that day, I have that ant- anticipation of, of having a nice buck right around the corner all the time. And so you get that same kind of level of excitement that the guy that's sitting in the tree stand gets when he sees a buck, even though it's beyond range, or he sees a deer that he might want to take. And, you know, it keeps that interest. Well, my interest is peaked all day long, almost to the point of, 
what most guys feel just before they're about to shoot a deer. Mine, my peak is that all day long. I have that anticipation that right around this corner is where that buck's going to be laying down or standing and feeding. Hmm. And so it keeps me that much more excited and interested, and it just makes my hunting experience that much better for me personally. And, and it isn't for everybody because a lot of guys just have a, a real hard time, um, you know, walking a lot. They think they, they don't want to spook the deer. I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, you know, I'm going to put myself where the deer are. I'm not going to wait for the deer to come to me. Right. And that's just been the reason why I transitioned into the, right. into the type of hunting I do. Now, how, how important is snow in your in your style? It's the most important thing. Okay. I mean, I... You can track in wet leaves. Um, you could track on a muddy day. But, you know, the success rate starts to really, 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 really lessen. Um, snow, obviously, <laughs> is is great because you can tell a lot of things when you use the snow. Um, you can tell the size of the deer. You can see antler marks in the snow when the deer feeds. You can almost sometimes tell just by the way he's traveling whether or not he's moving quickly enough where you can kind of step up the pace a little bit or whether he's starting to feed a little bit and he might be bedding down soon, so you better really, really slow your pace down and start looking for a whitetail. So there's a lot of things the snow helps you get to that you can't necessarily get to when you're hunting, you know, on dry ground without any snow at all or even even over leaves. Um, it's easier to tell how old the track is sometimes based on how frozen it is, how much snow there is in the track itself, whether there's a dusting or none, or maybe the track you can just tell that, <coughs> excuse me, that it was, um, you know, anything that should be frozen that isn't is a pretty recent track. Right. So there's all those elements that kind of it make it that much more exciting and that much more, you gain that much more knowledge in a shorter period of time, which allows you to be, uh, to make a better game plan with snow on than you can without the snow. Gotcha. Can does the snow teach you where the deer are when there's no snow? Uh, yes, it it absolutely does. As far as um, the bigger bucks are concerned, because you know they travel differently than just any old deer travel. Obviously, the does and fawns and the younger bucks um, they spend a lot more time traveling around during times of the day when bucks bigger bucks won't travel. So. In the snow, if you're constantly picking up bigger buck tracks, you know, if that's what you're hunting for, and that's what you seem to get to every time you get in the woods, it kind of gives you an idea for where some of the bigger deer like to hang out in the area. Um, during the night, you'll find that, uh, you know, if you, if you come in where you have an early, a new snow overnight, you come in the morning and you can sense where most of the deer have come out to feed this, when the snow stopped overnight, and you'll get just inundated with tracks. And... You don't necessarily learn as much about that as you do when you have some snow that's been on for a while. It may not have snowed for a few days, and you can tell fresher tracks a little bit better that way sometimes. Just, uh, you know, it's just easier to tell sometimes in the wet snow how, how much fresher a track is. And when you find the fresher tracks in the bigger bucks, it kind of tells you where that buck's been hanging out in that specific area. And nine times out of ten, you're, you'll be right about, you know, that that's the area that you want to, kind of hit and then that transfers over to when there isn't any snow mm -hmm. that buck's probably still going to be hanging in that area so you have a lot better chance if you're still hunting to maybe put yourself in a place where you have a good opportunity to see that buck as opposed to maybe other spots where you in the snow you haven't seen a lot of big buck travel right. or, or deer travel at all those are places you're probably going to, want to avoid when there's no snow on right so there's an edu you get a lot more education in the snow because it tells you a lot more a lot sooner than it does without snow. Safe to say that it reveals some of the patterns uh, much more readily than no snow. Absolutely. Okay. Unfortunately, you know, we uh, you're at the mercy of the weather, right. and we've had seasons where there hasn't been enough snowfall to even do much hunting. So you know that makes it a little more difficult. Right. But knowing from years past, if you hunt same spots year in and year out or general areas, um, it still gives you an idea for, you know, where the bigger bucks tend to be hanging out. And uh, when you don't have snow, you can still put yourself at least in the general vicinity of where there might be um, a decent buck to hunt right. or just bucks in general. It's a little harder in the snow to tell, um, you know, smaller track deer whether or not they're buck or doe simply by just 
looking at the track and how the track travels. Um, young bucks tend to act a lot like does and fawns act. Um, they it, a lot of signs there would be more like urination patterns because bucks and does urinate differently so that the urination would be in a different spot on a buck track than it will be on a doe track. Right. And those are things that most guys don't take into account. And uh, But for the most part, for me, I'm usually looking for bigger deer and trying to figure out where they might be hanging out so that if I don't get them on the snow tracking them, when we don't have snow, I still have an idea that of the general area where I can... Uh, maybe just happen upon one when I'm still hunting. Right. Okay. So if you don't have snow, you shift to a still hunt kind of style? Yeah. That's that's usually what I do. I, You know, you walk a little bit, you look a little bit, you walk a little bit, you right. look a little bit. And here again, in areas where I know to be um, either a lot of deer that it's frequent, which during um, the rut, you know, you're going to have a lot more activity um, with bigger bucks and bucks in general. Right. But I, and it, and it, I just put myself in those areas, and a lot of times you'd be surprised. When you don't sit around and wait for deer that may or may not be moving, I mean, most guys like to, to focus in on the rut, which is a great thing, because the bigger bucks and all bucks are doing a lot, has a lot more activity than they'll ever be during that course of the season. But see, for me, is you know, you have the pre-rut, you have the rut, and then you have the post-rut, and then it, in the pre and the post-rut, that happens differently for a lot of bucks so does the rut but i mean usually that rut period of time there's a window there that we know we're going to see a lot of deer prior to that post that um sitting around and waiting for bucks a lot of times is you know you can sit there a long time before you see anything with antlers um and that, and that's because they aren't moving the same way that they would especially the bigger bucks they, you know they have no reason to move if they would just as soon be safe and come out in the dark and we all talk about the nocturnal thing well, the way I hunt kind of, it doesn't eliminate the nocturnal uh, difficulty, but it's sometimes it puts you in places where, regardless of whether the deer is waiting to come out at night, if you're, you know, not that far from him and you can see him before he sees you, you've gained the advantage. If you sit in your tree stand and that deer's, you know, half a mile away from you, your chances of seeing him before sundown is uh, probably a lot slimmer. Right. Right. That's how that's how I work when I when I think about how I like the deer hunt. Right. All right. So bring us back to let's say for example there's snow on the ground. How do you find your first track? You just keep going until you come up. I here again. I look for spots where um, I would think that a buck would be laying, maybe near a food source, next to a, a very thick area, and maybe a swamp type of area, maybe a thicket type area. Um, maybe just a place that I know that I've frequented enough times and picked up decent tracks, I'll go to that area and try and um, pick a track up there. When you're talking about the big ones, like the Adirondacks, it's uh, it's a little more hit or miss. And usually there, what you do is you just get on a beeline and you just head in one direction until you cross a track. And the deeper and farther back you get um, seems to be, you know, you're best chance of actually coming across something that's decent to be able to follow so it's a hit or miss thing really okay I mean, so you're it's not, it's not a science so much as it is just a lot of legwork okay so you're, you're not wow. in like for example the benoits out of vermont they'll get in casper their giant white suburban and they'll drive around until they find a track then they'll get on foot so you're not doing that you're actually you're not on a four-wheeler you're you're actually in an area you kind of know already walking, finding the track, and going from there? Yeah, depending on where I'm tracking. When I'm tracking in a more suburban type of, uh, you know, something more central New York as opposed to Adirondacks, it's two different types of hunting. So, you know, there I'm, I'm on a piece of property where I know there's, there, there are bucks there, and your chance of finding a track is a lot easier there because the deer density is a lot greater. Um, the range of the, of the bucks is a lot um, narrower. So it's a little bit more easy to come across maybe something that, you know, you might want to follow. We're talking about the vastness of the Adirondacks and, and where the Benoits actually hunt. That's the type of thing that you may want to do. When I drive in my truck, it's usually onto a dirt road on some piece of state land, you know, in remote area of the Adirondacks. And, yeah, you might drive for a while paying attention to what might across the road and check every anything you see that looks like a track going across. Okay. And then there's hot spots that you have that you've hunted for years and you know that it's always held a decent buck and you get into those areas and you try and 
figure out spots based on the weather conditions that day, um, you know, where a buck might be laying down. Uh, some days it's high on top of a mountain, some days it's on the side of a mountain, depending on what the weather conditions are. Right. So those factors come into play, too, to kind of increase your chances of finding an actual track. But the, the possibility of going a whole day without finding a track, I mean, it's happened. <laughs> it happens. Right. Not a lot, but, I mean, it, it does happen more often than most guys would think. You just don't go into the woods, and every time you walk into the woods, you come across the you know these terrific whitetail tracks. It doesn't always happen that way. There's right. a lot of... A lot of time involved sometimes before you pick up something. Yeah, and I've seen situations where we've had a good snowfall. I've gone out. I'm expecting to see tracks right away in certain areas, and nothing's moved yet. I'm like, what the heck's right. going on? And then probably the hardest time to actually find a good track is when there's the the newest of snowfalls. Right. And it's simply because they're still bat the hatches are still batting down for them. Uh, you know, they'll wait a little while, maybe. Th- Hopefully the temperature might warm up a little bit. Maybe they they got a good meal long before the storm hit or the, or the snowfall hit so that, you know, they, they're sitting and they're just kind of chewing their cud and buying their time a little bit. But, um, you know, so those, those are kind of factors that are involved in that too. Um, just, it's, it's just getting to know how deer are in certain areas, how the weather affects them. You know, bitter cold is a tough time to really be tracking any animal. Right. I mean, they have to conserve energy just like you and I would want to conserve energy And when we're talking about the bitter cold. We don't want to go outside of our home when it's, you know, zero degrees outside. It's just not as much fun. And for deer, it's more about energy conservation. You know, they expel a lot more energy during the cold weather than they do when it starts to warm up even with snow on the ground. So you have to take that into consideration that you're going to have a much harder time in a really bitter cold weather uh, finding moving animals and animals that have moved over the evening where it's been probably its coldest. So that's another factor to kind of take in when you're you're thinking about going out and tracking. You're going to have a tougher time that the days where it's bitter cold. Right. But what you are going to have is if you do find an animal or a track, um, the chances of an animal holding tighter and staying in the bed longer with a very bitter cold is a lot greater. Again, he doesn't want to expel the energy if they don't have to. And even though they may even see you, they may decide to make a decision in their head whether or not they want to bolt or they want to kind of ride it out and see if you'll just walk past them. And, you know, those are the kind of things that you have to contend with as well. Right. And that's even the same without snow on. I mean, when it's bitter cold and there's no snow on the ground, it's a lot tougher to see animals moving. It just isn't something that they like to do during that time. Right. Take us through the, the hunt itself when you're doing a track in snow. What kind of pace are you on? when you're uh, on a deer? That's a good question. Um, normally, what what happens first is, you know, obviously first you find the track. And then you kind of have to decipher what the track tells you immediately. Uh, first of all, you want to kind of figure out how fresh the track is. And when I say how fresh, I'm not looking to find out if it's if he's right ahead of me or I'm just kind of trying to figure out if I've got a lot of distance that I can cover quickly. Um, I try and figure out uh, especially in the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks is a little bit different than down in the, the southern tier, what we call upstate uh, New York, in central New York here, where it's more residential, more or more agricultural, I'll say. Because the deer don't travel as far, when you pick up a track, you need to really be on the alert right from the get-go. Because the deer don't travel as far here, so your chances of catching up to this deer, you know, within a few hundred yards is, is actually quite high, uh, where in the Adirondacks, a deer could travel two, three, four mountains before he catches up to any kind of a doe that he wants to be on. I mean, they'll really run a straight line for a long, long time, and when you're they're traveling in a straight line in the Adirondacks, that usually means they're, they're moving. And when they're moving, they're not running, but I mean, they're moving right along. So you can move right along until you see the track start to meander a little bit, which either means that they've uh, usually means they're going to start to feed a little bit, and then shortly after they feed, they bed down. So you want to really start slowing down then. And when I say slow down, if you think you're being too slow, you're being too fast. It's that kind of a slowdown. I mean, to the point where you're taking one step and maybe standing there and just kind of using your eyeballs for a few minutes, and then another real nice, easy, deliberate step, trying not to get picked off before you get a chance to see that buck. Okay. So it become it's definitely I mean it's a, it's a game where 
they're at the advantage. They know that their territory a lot better than you do, and you get better at it as you go. You know what to look for. Um, that's one of the big things is when the crunch time comes is don't look for, not looking for a full deer necessarily, but looking for bits and pieces of of ear or, you know, the whites maybe of a tail or a flicker of a tail or just a horizontal line that just doesn't fit the rest of the geography. And, you, you know, you're looking out and you say, geez, you know, I, that doesn't fit. Everything else is running vertically, and I see this little horizontal thing that just doesn't make sense to me. And a lot of times it ends up being the back of the deer, the stomach of a deer, you know, something that you can pick out, and once you kind of focus in on it, um, you know, you can tell that it is a white tail, and it, then you have to determine whether or not it's the deer you've been tracking. Right. And that's the game. So at, when you say they meander, you mean that they start to move side to side off their trail? Yeah, kind of, they, yeah. They would, when I say straight line, I don't necessarily mean something that you would, you know, draw with a ruler. But um, you can tell that they're actually trying to get from point A to point B in a hurry. Um, and it, it usually just because they want to check out beyond a certain point. But you know, there always comes a time when they have to either slow down because they're tired, they're hungry, um, they just they need to bed down, or it could be because you know you may encounter more than one track you may get to where the buck actually found it though and the doe you know they they don't tend to move quite as much as the buck does travel that much they just do what they do naturally feeding and bedding down and just kind of you know meandering and that's pretty much what the buck will do once he catches the doe because he's just going to kind of mirror her the rest of the day so um when i say meander that's pretty much just what you described is what i mean is they kind of you know do a little bit of a side to side or they start to circle something a little bit or you'll just see that they'll stop at a at a log and eat the mushrooms off the log or they'll eat the moss off the log or they'll dig in the ground and and grab something maybe some old fern or something you know and you'll catch an antler tip in the snow you might even catch depending on how deep the snow is and how their heads you might even catch the whole image of a whole side beam and and antlers and you might know exactly what you what kind of rack he's got before you ever see him Gotcha. And those are all things that, you know, kind of get you closer to knowing whether or not you're going to pull the trigger when you get to see him. Gotcha. So it's almost like you know, they uh, equate to our maybe a, a traveling experience a human might have. They're on the highway. They're going pretty much as fast as they're going to go, and then they get to this, their destination, get on the back roads, they start kind of slowing down a little bit. That's exactly what the same type of concept, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Now, uh, when you're... And the the pace at which you're going, um, is it a it's a slower, methodical pace, or you're going as fast as you can based off of the pattern that the deer is leaving for you? Uh, in the more southern regions, that when I'm hunting more residential type areas, not I shouldn't say residential. It's not really necessary residential, but you know, a more uh, dense population of whitetails. It's it's very methodical, right from the get go. Uh, up north, I mean, I've I've gone to where I'm I'm moving right along. I mean, I'm taking giant steps and I'm just walking as fast as I can without getting into a, a run, just because I know that I have to make up some time on the deer. Otherwise, I'll be walking all day long and not gain any ground on it. Right. So you know, the, and, and it all just depends on on how you read the track and what you think is going on. And sometimes you're wrong. You just you just make the wrong decision and you think the buck's on a beeline. And, you know, next thing you know, you're right on top of him, and he sees you before you see him. Right. And, you know, that pretty much, it's over for a little while okay. there. So if you're in the Adirondacks, you're moving at a, at a pretty brisk pace, and do you care about wind direction? Do you care about scent control? You, you start sweating a little bit? How do, you, how do you factor all that in? I use the wind direction 100% when I hunt. Okay. If, if I have to track into the wind, I know I'm, it's going to be futile. I just know that that, that the, there's one thing that you cannot trick is a buck's nose. I, I don't care what scent control you use. I mean, I, I've i used uh, scent lock back when scent lock was making their scent lock clothing out of out of their garage. And it it absolutely works. But there's no such thing as 100% scent free. It just doesn't happen. A, a deer's nose is just too great. There's, you can't completely and totally fool a deer's nose. Um, at least at ground level without without doing something where you're actually up above him where you're not actually putting your scent anywhere in his path. 
Right. So for me, it's a hundred percent playing the wind. And fortunately, that most of the time when deer travel, they travel the same way. They travel into the wind. So you're traveling behind them, and for the most part, they're not going to smell you. You're, you're, although you're very, very conscious of how the wind's blowing and how you're going to approach, um, especially when you think that it's crunch time, how you're going to approach the area and you know how you're going to do things, you always have to consider the wind, especially when you're just still, still hunting and not even tracking. I mean, that's even more important because... You don't really know the direction the deer is traveling, and you're just hoping to put yourself in an area where you might spot a piece of the deer. So you always want to make sure that you, however you approach an area you think is, is going to be, could be productive, you don't ever want to produ- uh, approach it where your scent is going into that area. It's just you, 100% of the time with a big buck, you are not going to see that buck if he smells you first. Right. I, and I mean 100% of the time. They do not, will not tolerate human scent at a certain point. Right. Now, when you get closer deer densities, when you're talking about guys who do hunt residential areas, maybe, you know, a 10, 15 acre spot behind their house where the deer are used to hu- human scent, then it becomes more of a distance thing for the deer. They know when the scent's stronger and not so strong. And that's where you're, you're reducing your scent really comes into play because the lesser scent they get, the less alarm they become. When we're talking about the Adirondack Mountains, where a deer doesn't smell a human being hardly ever, they get the slightest whiff of human scent, and it's all over. They'll put as much distance between you and them as they can possibly put. Um, They won't try and sneak around you. They'll just put distance between you. And that's just a difference between hunting two different types of deer, how the density is, how they travel, and how their normal course of the day is, and what they're used to, um, and what they'll tolerate. So it's different in both areas. The Adirondacks is a much tougher place to hunt and have your scent be an issue. It's definitely an issue in the Adirondacks. Okay. Down okay. in the other zones, not you know, you could probably get away with a little bit of um, scent, simply mask it enough where it doesn't become alarming, and you could put yourself at least maybe in gun range of a deer. Okay. So in areas that are you're more rural where there are no people, wind direction means a lot. Oh, it means a ton because when deer aren't used to smelling human scent, that's it's the biggest red flag that they uh, that they'll encounter. I mean, it, anything that doesn't seem right to them, it, they don't it's, they don't have the the fight or flee response. Their response is strictly flee. So they're going to put as much distance between that smell and them as they can, and that'll put them on the alert for quite some time until they don't smell the thing anymore. Right. Right. Where deer in the in the uh, less rural areas are going to always be on alert, because it's a little bit tougher for them to you know to distinguish uh, scent is it, than it is for the deer in the Adirondacks or more remotely um, a remote deer. Gotcha, Joe. That has uh, all been fantastic advice. I really appreciate you spending some time with us this afternoon awesome. to go over all that. Good to do it. Very glad to do it. That's I, excellent. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, how do if uh, if people wanted to reach out to you? How do you how do we contact you? Uh, they can actually get me through the website, which is www.newyorkantler-outdoors.com, or you can just type New York Antler into the Google search, and I'm usually the first ten pages that are available there. Um, hmm. They can also type in white tailed deer and come up with the same thing. Gotcha. Um, cool. So, and then they, and through the web site they can either contact me through the page and i usually have my email address up there for those who want to send me stories or photos and i encourage guys to do that that's what makes the website work gotcha we'll uh we'll post a link from our site to yours um in the show notes as well and um we really appreciate you spending some time um so again thank you from the big buck registry and all our listeners to uh all the new york antler outdoor fans uh thank you for coming on board here Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. All right, cool. Uh, Joe, we'll catch you again. We'll catch you in the woods sometime. Okay, good talking to you. All right, All right everybody. That was Joe Cervello from New York Antler Outdoors, and uh, we're wrapping up. We're right at the end of our time frame here, so um, we're going to call it a wrap, and we'll see you again next week on the Big Buck Registry Big Buck Podcast. Mm-hmm.